Chapter Six of Triplanetary, first in the Lensman series by E. E. Doc Smith. Recording by Phil Chenever. Chapter Six, Nineteen Hundred and Unknown. Theodore K. Kinnison. A crisp, clear voice snapped from the speaker of an apparently cold, ordinary-looking enough radio television set. A burly young man caught his breath sharply as he leaped to the instrument and pressed an inconspicuous button. Theodore K. Kinnison acknowledging. The plate remained dark, but he knew that he was being scanned. Operation Bullfinch, the speaker blatted. Kinnison gulped. Operation Bullfinch, off, he managed to say. Off. He pushed the button again and turned to face the tall, trim, honey blonde who stood tensely poised in the archway. Her eyes were wide and protesting, both hands clutched at her throat. Ah, uh -huh, sweets, they're coming. Over the pole, he gritted. Two hours, more or less. Oh, Ted! She threw herself into his arms. They kissed, then broke away. The man picked up two large suitcases, already packed. Everything else, including food and water, had been in the car for weeks, and made strides. The girl rushed after him, not bothering even to close the door of the apartment, scooping up en passant a leggy boy of four and a chubby, curly-haired girl of two or thereabouts. They ran across the lawn toward a big, low-slung sedan. "'Sure you got your caffeine tablets?' he demanded as they ran. "'Uh-huh. You'll need them. Drive like the devil. Stay ahead. You can. This heap has got the legs of a centipede, and you've got plenty of gas and oil. Eleven hundred miles from anywhere and a population of one-tenth per square mile. You'll be safe there if anybody is.' "'It isn't us I'm worried about. It's you,' she panted. "'Techno's wives get a few minutes' notice ahead of the H-blast. I'll be ahead of the rush, and I'll stay ahead. It's you, Ted, you!' "'Don't worry, Keed. That popsicle of mine has got legs, too, and there won't be so much traffic, the way I'm going.' "'Oh, Blast, I didn't mean that, and you know it.' They were at the car. While he jammed the two bags into an exactly fitting space, she tossed the children into the front seat, slid lithely behind the wheel, and started the engine. I know you didn't, sweetheart. I'll be back. He kissed her and the little girl, the while shaking hands with his son. Kidlets, you and your mother are going out to visit Granddad Kennison, like we told you all about. Lots of fun. I'll be along later. Now, Lady Leadfoot, scram and shovel on the coal. The heavy vehicle backed and swung. Gravel flew as the accelerator pedal hit the floor. Kinnison galloped across the alley and opened the door of a small garage, revealing a long, squat motorcycle. Two deft passes of his hands, and two of his three spotlights were no longer white. One flashed a brilliant purple, the other a searing blue. He dropped a perforated metal box into a hanger and flipped a switch. A peculiarly toned siren began its ululating shriek. He took the alley turn at the angle of forty-five degrees, burned the pavement towards Diversey. The light was red. No matter. Everybody had stopped. That siren could be heard for miles. He barreled into the intersection. His step plate ground the concrete as he made a screaming left turn. A siren creeping up from behind. City tone, two red spots, city cop. So soon, good. He cut his gun a trifle. The other bike came alongside. Is this it? The uniform rider yelled over the coughing thunder of the competing exhausts. Yes, Kennison yelled back. Clear diversity to the outer drive, and the drive south to Gary and north to Waukegan. Snap it up. The white and black motorcycle slowed, shot over toward the curb. The officer reached for his microphone. Kinnison sped on. At Cicero Avenue, although he had a green light, traffic was so heavy that he had to slow down. At Pulaski, two policemen waved him through a red. Beyond Sacramento, nothing moved on wheels. Seventy, seventy-five. He took the bridge at eighty, both wheels in the air for forty feet. Eighty-five, ninety. That was about all he could do and keep the heap on so rough a road. 
Also, he did not have diversity all to himself any more. Blue and purple flashing bikes were coming in from every side street. He slowed to a conservative fifty and went into close formation with the other riders. The H-Blast, the citywide warning for the planned and supposedly orderly evacuation of all Chicago, sounded, but Kinnison did not hear it. Across the park, edging over to the left so that the boys going south would have room to make the turn, even such riders as those need some room to make a turn at fifty miles an hour. Under the viaduct, biting brakes and squealing tires at that sharp, narrow right-angle left turn, north on the wide, smooth drive. That highway was made for speed. So were those machines. Each rider, as he got into the flat, lay down along his tank, tucked his chin behind the crossbar, and twisted both throttles out against their stops. They were in a hurry. They had a long way to go, and if they did not get there in time to stop those transpolar atomic missiles, all hell would be out for noon. Why was all this necessary? This organization, this haste, this split-second timing? This citywide exhibition of insane hippodrome riding? Why were not all these motorcycle racers stationed permanently at their posts, so as to be ready for any emergency? because America, being a democracy, could not strike first, but had to wait, wait in instant readiness until she was actually attacked. Because every good techno in America had his assigned place in some American defense plan, of which Operation Bullfinch was only one, because without the presence of those technos at their everyday jobs, all ordinary technological work in America would perforce have stopped. A branch road curved away to the right. Scarcely slowing down, Kinnison bulleted into the turn and through an open, heavily guarded gate. Here his mount and his lights were passwords enough. The real test would come later. He approached a towering structure of alloy, jammed on his brakes, stopped beside a soldier who, as soon as Kinnison jumped off, mounted the motorcycle and drove it away. Kinnison dashed up to an apparently blank wall, turned his back upon four commissioned officers holding cocked forty-fives at the ready, and fitted his right eye into a cup. Unlike fingerprints, retinal patterns cannot be imitated, duplicated, or altered. Any impostor would have died instantly, without arrest or question. For every man who belonged aboard that rocket had been checked and tested. How he had been checked and tested! since one spy in any one of those Techno's chairs could wreck damage untellable. The port snapped open. Kinnison climbed the ladder into the large but crowded operations room. Hi, Teddy. A yellow rose. Hi, Walt. Hi, Red. What ho, Baldy. And so on. These men were friends of old. Where are they? he demanded. Is our stuff getting away? Let me take a peek at the ball. I'll say it is. Okay, Ted, squeeze in here. He squeezed in. It was not a ball, but a hemisphere, slightly oblate and centered approximately by the North Pole. A multitude of red dots moved slowly. A hundred miles upon that map was a small distance, northward over Canada, a closer-packed, less numerous group of yellowish-greens already on the American side of the pole was coming south. As had been expected, the Americans had more missiles than did the enemy. The other belief that America had more adequate defenses and better trained, more highly skilled defenders would soon be put to the test. A string of blue lights blazed across the continent, from Nome through Skagway and Wollaston and Churchill and Kaniapiskau to Belle Isle, America's first line of defense, regulars all. Ambers almost blanketed those blues. Their combat rockets were already grabbing altitude. The second line, from Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver across to Halifax, also showed solid green, with some flashes of amber, part regulars, part National Guard. Chicago was in the third line, all National Guard, extending from San Francisco to New York. Green, alert and operating, so were the fourth the fifth and the sixth. 
Operation Bullfinch was clicking on schedule to the second. A bell clanged. The men sprang to their stations and strapped down. Every chair was occupied. Combat rocket number 10685, full-powered by the disintegrating nuclei of unstable isotopes, took off with a whooshing roar which even her thick walls could not mute. The technos, crushed down into their form-fitting cushions by three Gs of acceleration, clenched their teeth and took it. Higher! Faster! The rocket shivered and trembled as it hit the wall at the velocity of sound, but it did not pause. Higher! Faster! Higher! Fifty miles high! One hundred! Five hundred! A thousand! Fifteen hundred! Two thousand! Half a radius! the designated altitude at which the Chicago contingent would go into action. Acceleration was cut to zero. The technos, breathing deeply in relief, donned peculiarly goggled helmets and set up their panels. Kinnison stared into his plate with everything he could put into his optic nerve. This was not like the ball in which the lights were electronically placed, automatically controlled, clear, sharp, and steady. This was radar, a radar considerably different from that of 1948, of course, and greatly improved, but still pitifully inadequate in dealing with objects separated by hundreds of miles and traveling at velocities of thousands of miles per hour. Nor was this like the practice cruises, in which the targets had been harmless barrels or equally harmless dirigible rockets. This was the real thing. The targets today would be lethal objects indeed. Practice gunnery, with only a place in the proficiency list at stake, had been exciting enough. This was too exciting, much too exciting, for the keenness of brain and the quickness and steadiness of eye and of hand so soon to be required. A target? Or was it? Yes, three, or four of them. Target one, zone ten. A quiet voice spoke into Kinnison's ear and one of the white specks upon his plate turned yellowish-green. The same words, the same lights, were heard and seen by the eleven other technos of Sector A, of which Kinnison, by virtue of standing at the top of the combat rocket's proficiency list, was Sector Chief. He knew that the voice was that of Sector A's fire control officer, whose duty it was to determine from courses, velocities, and all other data to be had from ground and lofty observers the order in which his sector's targets should be eliminated. And Sector A, an imaginary but sharply defined cone, was, in normal maneuvering, the hottest part of the sky. Fire Control's Zone 10 had informed him that the object was at extreme range and hence there would be plenty of time. Nevertheless, Lawrence, two, Doyle, one, Drummond, stand by with three. He snapped at the first word. In the instant of hearing his name, each techno stabbed down a series of studs, and there flowed into his ears a rapid stream of figures, the up-to-the-second data from every point of observation as to every element of motion of his target. He punched the figures into his calculator which would correct automatically for the motion of his own vessel, glanced once at the printed solution of the problem, tramped down upon a pedal once, twice, or three times, depending upon the number of projectiles he had been directed to handle. Kinnison had ordered Lawrence, a better shot than Doyle, to launch two torpedoes, neither of which at such long range was expected to strike its mark. His second, however, should come close so close that the instantaneous data sent back to both screens and to Kennison's by the torpedo itself would make the target a sitting duck for Doyle, the less proficient follower. Drummond, Kennison's number three, would not launch his missiles unless Doyle missed. Nor could both Drummond and Harper, Kennison's number two, be out at once. One of the two had to be in at all times, to take Kinnison's place in charge of the sector if the chief were ordered out. For while Kinnison could order either Harper or Drummond on target, he could not send himself. He could go out only when ordered to do so by fire control. Sector chiefs were reserved for emergency use only. 
Target two, zone nine, fire control said. Carney two, French one, day stand by with three, Kinnison ordered. Damn it, missed. This from Doyle. Buck fever, no end. Okay, boy, that's why we're starting so soon. I'm shaking like a vibrator myself. We'll get over it. The point of light, which represented target one, bulged slightly and went out. Drummond had connected and was back in. Target three, zone eight, four eight, fire control remarked. Target three, Higgins and Green. Harper, stand by. Four, Case and Santos. Lawrence. After a minute or two of actual combat, the technos of Sector A began to steady down. Standby men were no longer required and were no longer assigned. Target 40, 1-6, set fire control, and Lawrence 2, Doyle 2, ordered Kinnison. This was routine enough, but in a moment... Ted, Lawrence snapped. Missed wide, both barrels. Forty ones dodging, manned or directed, coming like hell. Watch it, Doyle. Watch it. Kinnison, take it. Fire control barked. Voice now neither low nor steady, and without waiting to see whether Doyle would hit or miss. It's in zone three already. Collision course. Harper, take over. Kinnison got the data, solved the equations, launched five torpedoes at fifty gravities of acceleration. One, two, three, four, five the last three as close together as they could fly without setting off their proximity fuses. Communications and mathematics and the electronic brains of calculating machines had done all that they could do. The rest was up to human skill, to the perfection of coordination and the speed of reaction of human mind, nerve, and muscle. Kinnison's glance darted from plate to panel to computer tape to meter to galvanometer and back to plate. His left hand moved in tiny arcs the knobs whose rotations varied the intensities of two mutually perpendicular components of his torpedo's drives. He listened attentively to the reports of triangulation observers, now giving him data covering his own missiles as well as the target object. The fingers of his right hand punched almost constantly the keys of his computer. He corrected almost constantly his torpedo's course. Up a hair, he decided. Left about a point. The target moved away from its predicted path. Down two, left three, down a hair. Right! The thing was almost through. Zone two was blasting into zone one. He thought for a second that his first torp was going to connect. It almost did. Only a last instant full-powered side thrust enabled the target to evade it. Two numbers flashed white upon his plate. His actual error, exact to the foot of distance and to the degree of the clock, measured and transmitted back to his board by instruments in his torpedo. Working with instantaneous and exact data, and because the enemy had so little time in which to act, Kinnison's second projectile made a very near miss indeed. His third was a graze, so close that its proximity fuse functioned detonating the cyclonite-packed warhead. Kinnison knew that his third went off, because the error figures vanished, almost in the instant of their coming into being, as its detecting and transmitting instruments were destroyed. That one detonation might have been enough, but Kinnison had had one glimpse of his error, how small it was, and had a fraction of a second of time. Hence four and five slammed home dead center. Whatever that target had been, it was no longer a threat. Kennison in, he reported briefly to fire control, and took over from Harper the direction of the activities of Sector A. The battle went on. Kennison sent Harper and Drummond out time after time. He himself was given three more targets. The first wave of the enemy, what was left of it, passed. Sector A went into action again at extreme range upon the second. Its remains, too, plunged downward and outward toward the distant ground. The third wave was really tough. Not that it was actually any worse than the first two had been, but the CR-10685 was no longer getting the data which her technos ought to have to do a good job, and every man aboard her knew why. 
Some enemy stuff had got through, of course, and the observatories, both on the ground and above it, the eye of the whole American defense had suffered heavily. Nevertheless, Kinnison and his fellows were not too perturbed. Such a condition was not entirely unexpected. They were now veterans. They had been tried and had not been found wanting. They had come unscathed through a bath of fire the like of which the world had never known before. Give them any kind of computation at all, or no computation at all, except old CR-10685's own radar and their own tarps, of which they still had plenty, and they could and would take care of anything that could be thrown at them. The third wave passed. Targets became fewer and fewer. Action slowed down, stopped. The Technos, even the Sector Chiefs, knew nothing whatever of the progress of the battle as a whole. They did not know where their rocket was, or whether it was going north, east, south, or west. They knew when it was going up or down only by the seats of their pants. They did not even know the nature of the targets they destroyed, since upon their plates all targets looked alike, small bright greenish-yellow spots. Hence, "'Give us the dope, Pete, if we got a minute to spare,' Kinnison begged of his fire control officer. "'You know more than we do. Give.' "'It's coming in now,' came the prompt reply. Six of those targets that did such fancy dodging were atomics aimed at the lines. Five were dirigibles with our number on them. You fellows did a swell job. Very little of their stuff got through. Not enough, they say, to do much damage to a country as big as the U.S.A.' On the other hand, they stopped scarcely any of ours. They apparently didn't have anything to compare with you technos. But all hell seems to be busting loose all over the world. Our east and west coasts are being attacked, they say, but are holding. Operation Daisy and Operation Fairfield are clicking, just like we did. Europe, they say, is going to hell. Everybody is taking pot shots at everybody else. One report says that the South American nations are bombing each other. Asia, too, nothing definite. As straight dope comes in, I'll relay it to you. We came through in very good shape, considering uh, losses less than anticipated, only 7%. The first line, as you know already, took a god-awful shellacking. In fact, the Churchill-Belcher section was practically wiped out, which was what lost us about all of our observation. We are now just about over the southern end of Hudson Bay, heading down and south to join in making the vertical fleet formation. No more waves coming, but they say to expect attacks from low-flying combat rockets. There goes the alert. On your toes, fellow. But there isn't a thing on Sector A's screen. There wasn't. Since the CR-10685 was diving downward and southward, there wouldn't be. Nevertheless, some observer aboard that rocket saw that atomic missile coming. Some fire control officer yelled orders, some technos did their best, and failed. And such is the violence of nuclear fission, so utterly incomprehensible is its speed, that Theodore K. Kennison died without realizing that anything whatever was happening to his ship or to him. Garlane of Edor looked upon ruined earth, his handiwork, and found it good. Knowing that it would be many of hundreds of Tellurian years before that planet would again require his personal attention, he went elsewhere, to Rigel IV, to Palane VII, and to the solar system of Valencia, where he found that his creatures, the overlords, were not progressing according to schedule. He spent quite a little time there, then searched minutely and fruitlessly for evidence of inimical activity within the innermost circle. And upon far Arisia a momentous decision was made. The time had come to curb sharply the hitherto unhampered Edorians. "'We are ready, then, to war openly upon them?' Euconidor asked, somewhat doubtfully. Again, to cleanse the planet Tellus of dangerous radioactives and of two noxious forms of life is, of course, a simple matter. From our protected areas in North America a strong but democratic government can spread to cover the world. 
That government can be extended easily enough to include Mars and Venus. But Garlane, who is to operate as Roger, who has already planted in the adepts of North Polar Jupiter the seeds of the Jovian Wars, your visualization is sound, youth. Think on. Those interplanetary wars are, of course, inevitable, and will serve to strengthen and to unify the government of the inner planets, provided that Gorlane does not interfere. Oh, I see. Gorlane will not at first know, since a zone of compulsion will be held upon him. When he or some Edorian fusion perceives that compulsion and breaks it, at some such time of high stress as the Nevian incident, it will be too late. Our fusions will be operating. Roger will be allowed to perform only such acts as will be for civilization's eventual good. Nevia was selected as prime operator because of its location in a small region of the galaxy which is almost devoid of solid iron and because of its watery nature, its aquatic forms of life being precisely those in which the Edorians are least interested. They will be given partial neutralization of inertia. They will be able to attain velocities a few times greater than that of light. That covers the situation, I think. Very good, Euconidor, the elders approved. A concise and accurate summation. Hundreds of Tellurian years passed. The aftermath, reconstruction, advancement, one world, two worlds, three worlds, united, harmonious, friendly. The Jovian Wars, a solid, unshakable union. Nor did any Edorian know that such fantastically rapid progress was being made. Indeed, Garlay knew, as he drove his immense ship of space towards Sol, that he would find Tellus inhabited by peoples little above savagery. And it should be noted in passing that not once, throughout all those centuries, did a man named Kinnison marry a girl with red bronze auburn hair and gold flecked tawny eyes. End of chapter six.